to Just Salvos, I'm Jen Peterson. Well, the Salvation Army have been in the media this week, perhaps for all the wrong reasons. We've heard of pay disputes with our West Care Social Program, which is in the western suburbs of Melbourne. Some people have been asking, well, why aren't they just doing the mission of the Salvation Army? Shouldn't they just be paid peanuts and be thankful for it? Well, it raises a good question about what is the mission of the Salvation Army and who should be doing it. I don't see that many Salvationists getting involved in our social programs who would be doing it for the right reasons, right reasons being Christian mission. And instead I see amazing, committed, professional social workers committing to low paid, amazing work out in West Care and many other social programs throughout the Territory. It raises some really good questions about what is the Salvation Army's mission and whose responsibility it is to help those who are falling into the category of the last, the least and the lost here in Australia. Well, one person who has some great things to say about Salvation Army Mission is actually not a Salvationist at all. It's John Smith, the CEO of Concern Australia, and he's synonymous with the God Squad. He's got some great things to say about the Salvation Army, our heritage, how we came to be, uh, the, the mission uh, that we came to be, part of our theology, part of our political movement. And he's got some great things to say to us today. So we really want you to stay tuned and watch this and then give us your thoughts on the Facebook site afterwards. Uh, my background is Methodist from way back, from the days before the Uniting Church. And of course, uh, the Salvation Army was born out of the Methodist nest. Tragically, Methodism had lost its uh, fire, kindled a flame of sacred love on the mean altar of my heart, as the old Wesley had said. Uh, they'd lost that, and so when William Booth and his wonderful wife came along, they failed to recognise that it wasn't a matter of whether you got through the theological college, it was a matter of vision and passion and gift. And so uh, the Methodists lost that uh, wonderful family. And I don't know if that was good or bad in that the good side was the Salvation Army was formed and of course it was free of all the encumbrances that had developed around traditional Methodism. So when you ask me what is my passion about justice, there's both a passion about justice issues and there's a passion about process and the manner in which we do mission. And they both concern the salvos of course, because when it comes to the practical side, um, there really aren't many groups or organisations more committed to the practice of reaching out and supplying essential whatever to those that are in need who've been treated unjustly or ignored by the society. But the thing that I would be concerned about is that I think that the whole network of Christian welfare organisations have become so enmeshed in support uh, particularly from government, that the prophetic voice that really marked the Salvation Army in the days of the old general, and for quite a long time afterwards, has been lost. I remember reading, I think it was the Marischal, one of the daughters who uh, they said turned up on stage in the Great Hall of Brussels, uh, dressed in sackcloth and ashes. They opened the, the curtain and there she was in sackcloth and ashes. And for, I think, some months she travelled around Europe prophesying against the greed and indifference to the poor and the, and the godliness, godlessness of, of Europe. I, I fear that so much of our welfare work has lost that prophetic voice because at the end of the day, Jesus preaching the kingdom of God uh, was as significant as Jesus healing and if he'd not preached the kingdom of God his healings would not have had the significance they had and his healings would not have addressed the sickness of the culture of his day or of ours. I guess that's part because that's my calling but I think the proclamation issue has been lost. When I first started uh, caring about the broken and the marginalised way back in the late 60s during the sort of cultural revolution of that period. Um, to talk about the gospel 
having as part of it social justice and social care was really to be quite radical. I mean, I had platforms closed to me in those days. You didn't have Micah Challenge, you didn't have quite the same uh, public awareness of the Salvation Army back in those days. And I, I've watched now over those decades since the 60s, and I've seen the church take up the issue of justice in wonderful ways, uh, particularly in practice, in fighting for fair trade, in uh, providing for homelessness, so many other areas of human need. But I wonder where the generation of prophetic voices are, because I think they've been largely silenced. The difficulty is that once we have to depend on those who love our outcomes, but don't share our worldview, is that you begin to weaken the base and it becomes Christians doing fine stuff. But after all, the primary message is that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So if we're not a Jesus movement, if we're just a welfare movement, quite frankly, our welfare will be weakened because there won't be a message that challenges for conversion and transformation across the culture. And then we'll just see more and more homelessness, more and more brokenness, more and more poverty, because the greed and the materialism and the unbelief of the culture feeds that brokenness. And then we end up as Christian groups just almost running breathless to keep up with the demand of the casualties of a society that has lost any meaning and purpose. So that really is a very strong concern for me. If, if I was to speak of an issue as such that most fires me, it's the issue of our indigenous people. Um, many years ago, I wrote a book called Advance Australia Where? And in that book, I talked about the issue of land, all of those kind of things that now are common to us. And I suppose having been part in those early days of a very outspoken um, movement that was pro our indigenous people, a movement that recognised that one of the things about the gospel was that it didn't come in the form of a packaged culture, but the gospel brought transformation in all sorts of cultures and therefore was universal. Uh, in all of that, I really felt back in those days, I felt by the end of the 70s that it was really going to change. And I'm heartbroken at present to see that we're basically back, almost back to the 50s again, in the way in which politically we're, we're dealing with the issue. I mean, even yesterday, uh, the Prime Minister is said to be going to Alice Springs so that she will now have a great idea about how to do these things through a spot visit to Alice Springs. They find that obscene. We don't sit down and really ask the tribal leaders what they know they need. Uh, we come with a paternalistic attitude that says their problem is alcohol, which is really our problem anyway. Um, we, we put minimal work into housing, into infrastructure for the Aboriginal people, and if we give it to them, we give it to them on our terms, not theirs. Um, I was talking to a, an anthropologist who'd been with the Owen Pally people for 25 years and who could actually speak the local language almost as well as English. And he said that it was typical that government people would come in and on one occasion at Owen Pelly, they said, here are three possibilities, one, two, three, which of these three do you want? I can't remember what they were, one of them was to do with water, one was to do with housing. Which of these three do you want? And the Owen Pelly said, number three. And the government said, thank you very much, and went back home and gave them number one, which is typical, we're not listening. And uh, I guess as I finish saying this, one of the things I learned from Jesus was not only that he spoke the truth uh, with such power, but that when you watch the story of Jesus, he did a lot of listening. He, he conversed with people in a beautiful way. Uh, the woman at the well is a classic example. 
of a conversation that leads naturally to him giving a solution to the felt need of that woman. And I don't think we're listening to the felt needs of our Indigenous people and I feel angry, I feel broken hearted. I, uh, I, I wish I could storm the parliament, both sides of the house, I feel a pox on them both because this ought to be the number one issue. We ought to almost have a moratorium about everything else until justice flows like a river for our Indigenous people.